Wow. Well, General Sir, thank you very much for a thought-provoking and very powerful speech. Um, we'll now throw open to Q&A briefly. Does anyone have a question? And if not, I've got one prepared. I was warned. Ah. And you Up can ask back. me any question. It doesn't have to go about what I said. It amazes me that NATO, um, a, a collection of very rich countries, has trouble countering a rampant Russia under Putin who is threatening Europe and yet the Western Europeans especially are not spending very much on defence. I'd just like your views on that, sir, and whether you see what you see can be done about that because it seems if Europe got together properly, even without the United States, they could completely stuff Putin up and make sure that they countered uh, new Russian imperialism. In the Netherlands, we all know what the time of the broken rival was. After the First World War, we said this will never happen again. So we had huge budget cuts on defence. And just a personal story, my father was an enlisted soldier in the Second World War. He was wanted to, to defend his country. He was lying on one side of the river and the Germans were standing on the other side. And my father shot at the Germans. He was a good shooter. He had a sharp eye. He didn't hit the Germans. Why? Because his rival was that old that he couldn't even reach the opposite of the river. These stories he told to me. But I said at the beginning of my lecture, we learn rather poorly from history. So again, whole Europe took the peace dividend after the Cold War. And now a lot of people think that President Trump is the first guy who is telling the Europeans that they should step up to the 2% rule we all agreed on within NATO. No, that's not true. Obama did it in his whole period as president of the US, but he did it within the room. And then clearly. But we Europeans, we forget to learn. And now we see that things are happening, that this world is changing. We see Putin, Putin investing in his armed forces again. And uh, now we know that we have to step up. I hope we are not too late. And you see in all, well, most of the European countries now that we, yes, we are ready to invest more in the armed forces. Um, and we should know that the Russians understand only one language. That's the language of power. Maybe somebody read the book of Bill Browder, Enemy of the Russian State. Somebody did? Well, then you know that Bill Browder gave his idea of the Russian. Now, the Australian doesn't exist. The Russian doesn't exist. But Bill Browder said what the Russian was. And I liked it. He said, just imagine you are a new prisoner in a Russian prison. And it's time to get fresh air. And you step into the field, and then you see, well, the chief of the villains in the prison, the biggest Russian there, coming at you. If you step aside, if you step back, they will not respect you. So walk against this villain, break a leg, be bruised, whatever the consequences, but then they will respect you. We have to keep that in mind. Yeah? Yes, sir. Any of us who are involved in training the next generation of leaders for the world that you've described? Well, it's one of the important, most important things that we have to do. We are obliged to teach and train and educate the future leaders. In the armed forces, leadership is core business, so to say. So we have to give them all the knowledge and experience that we have, and then also teach them about the new things that's going on. We must take time. We must, have, we must put a lot of effort in it. Uh, but I think it's doable. And ask the military around. I think 
that they all will agree. If you see our young soldiers, our young sergeants, our young lieutenants, then they are great. They are doing a great job. They are even better than I was as a lieutenant. So don't come at me that our youth is, well, not that good. No, we have fine youngsters. It's our responsibility to give them what they need and also to give them the right values and ethics so that they have a good moral compass. Because they, these youngsters, they have to get their own experience. But if we put the moral compass of them right, they have the best chance that when they have to take somewhere in a company or for military in a mission, when they have to take a split-second decision, if the moral compass is right, they will have the best chance to take the right decision. But it's our job to give them all the knowledge, the values, and it's doable because they are good. You touched on early in your talk that um, you know the face of warfare is changing, and um, certainly it was traditionally sort of said that um, you know war is policy by other means. How do you sort of see with the advent of the fact that the the actual act of war is blurring with the um, the advent of cyber? Um, how do you fi feel that the world is prepared for the fact that the definition of warfare is certainly not going to be what it was uh, yesterday? The simple answer is no. We are not prepared enough. We all have to step up. Um, because when we talk about war, we talk about a battlefield. Whether it's digital or not, it's a battlefield. And those who are the fastest, those who can take faster decisions than the others, they will win. But the others play that game too. So it's difficult. We, have to, we need all the knowledge, not only in the military, but we have to get the civil and military knowledge coming together, and we need other people. In the Netherlands, I said that we need people who are sitting at home, well, not so slim, have a ponytail, sit for 23 hours a day behind their computer. We have to get them in, in the armed forces to safeguard our country. So they don't have to walk around in a mission with 50 kilograms on their back and do patrols for days. No, use them in their strength. And so we have to find these people and, and help to safeguard the, the, the world, our, the world that we see, and our countries. And um, at the moment, we can do better. As simple as that. So it's worrisome. Yeah. General, good evening. My name is Peter McDermott. I'm the Secretary of the National Body of the AUSI. Holland, like Australia, plays on the global stage. And you've been in Iraq and lots of places, and we've worked together. But if you take the views of President Macron, who says that the, end, the, the, the days of NATO perhaps might be numbered, if you look at the situation where global challenges are regional challenges and regional challenges are global challenges, what sort of structure do you see that the world needs to generate to counter the forces of evil? Well, I think that we have the structures that we need. But what we don't have is the endurance the stamina, stamina as international community to do the things in the right manner and to do them as long as is necessary. So look, I'm not blaming the UN, I'm blaming all the countries. When do we step in? That's when the things went wrong. We don't start when a country, we see that it could become a failed state, now we wait that the misery is there a lot of people have to pay for that. The population is well treated. They have misery, war, and then we step in. We're always too late. And that means that you have to repair more, so to say. And then in a lot of the countries, the saying is, you have the clock, but we have the time. They just sit it out. 
examples enough in history. And then, as international community, after a few years, we think it's enough. But if you want to rebuild a failed state, it needs sometimes decades. And we are not willing to do that. But we ought to do it. Otherwise, it will go wrong again. So I think that a lot of organizations are there. It's about the political and societal will in a lot of countries to do this. If you just look, uh, I've been to Bosnia Herzegovina. People go on holiday there, but still the international community is there to help them because we know there is still a risk or a chance that it will go in the wrong direction. That's what we should do in other countries too. And then let me say I'm very thankful for what Australia is doing in this regard and what the Australian troops are doing in a, a lot of missions. They are doing really good work. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for your talk. Peter Rose, USI of the ACT. Could you depict for us, please, NATO after Brexit? I think that the question implies that this should be a problem. It isn't. The Brits want to stay in NATO. They've uh, fought a hard diplomatic uh, fight to get a Brit <coughs> named as a uh, position as the chairman of the military committee. Because they know when Brexit goes on and, well, if you want to have my opinion about Brexit, where, where do our senses go? But <clears throat> they step out of the EU. OK. But that's for the Brits even more important now to stay within NATO and keep contributing. And what Macron is saying, that's a reaction on what somebody else on the other side of the ocean is saying. That doesn't necessarily mean that France is getting out of NATO. We have seen that once. They returned. Yeah. So they learned at least a bit from history. Yeah. So uh, for NATO, Brexit is not a problem. But Brexit is, for all the other aspects, a real problem. Yeah. You want left? I Hi, sir. Julian Heinen. Uh, I'm an infantry officer and unfortunately have lost soldiers in Afghanistan, so thank you very much for your uh, incredible insight. Uh, all too often, tactical actions have very much strategic influences, as you've alluded to, particularly with the impact on society, uh, but it appears that you've had a vast effect strategically on the tactical or operational levels. Are you prouder of your strategic actions or at the tactical level or more broadly at the strategic level with obviously your great alliances with Australia and other nations. Yeah. Um, maybe an example uh, makes clear how I am, where, I, where I'm standing. I um, went to visit the troops in Afghanistan and I got out of the plane and my commander said, sir, skip the program. Okay, what's on? No, we tell you inside. When I was inside, they told me that we had supported the Brits who were in, were in an ambush. And the Brits asked for air support, so two Dutch F-16s supported them. The pilot did all his checks, and then you know probably that when we have contact with the colleagues on the floor, uh, on the ground, then everything is put on tape, the radio communication put on tape. The pilot push a button, what he sees is on film, because we evaluate all the actions. And together they decide, yes, the Taliban is fighting from houses. On one house is the, well, the mass of a fire coming from. You have to bomb that house. The pilot flies on, and just before he throw, wants to throw his bomb, a man comes out of the house. And this man doesn't have a weapon. 
So he's a civilian. Pilot flies off. He waits till this guy is gone, returns and bombs the house. Just one bomb. The rest of the Taliban thought, we won't, don't, won't wait for the second bomb and they could, well, if you've been an infantry officer there, you know how it goes. So they went off and the Brits came away without casualties. But then we got a report from the local elders of this village. And they said that indeed some strange male in that house were killed. Well, you can say Taliban, but also the inhabitants of that house. We had made civil casualties. Now, then tactic and strategic come very close to each other. So I went to the pilot. I listened to his tape together with him. I looked at his film. And I'll give you the whole story. The pilot was in tears. And he said to me, sir, I'm guilty for killing civilians. I made civil casualties. And I well, was startled by that. And I looked him in the eye and said, hey, now you, you bear with me. I have to explain something to you. You and I, we are responsible for civilian casualties. But guilty, that's the Taliban who fights from houses and don't let the inhabitants go. So I looked at him and I said, so, if I may speak for myself, I can go on with my life with the feeling of being responsible. But it would be much worse if I had the feeling and the idea that I was guilty on civil casualties. He looked at me and he thanked me. He never thought about the difference between responsibility and guilt. So I stepped out of the room and I had my press officer always with me. And I said to the press officer, Robin, that's his first name, Robin, it's now evening in the Netherlands. See to it that I come live on radio or telly. I'm going to explain what happened. Now, my motto has always been that true loyalty to a boss is daring and being able and willing to say no three times to your boss. That's true loyalty. And Robin knew that. So he said to me, no, sir, you can't do that. We have protocol. We have to inform the minister, the government, and then a press conference in The Hague, and then you get go live on telly or radio. Well, this time I said to Robin, Robin, something wrong with your ears? Three times this evening was one time. So I was live on radio in the Netherlands, and I explained what had happened, that we, not my pilot, you stand in front of your soldiers. Now, we are responsible. And I explained that we were not guilty. The same evening, it wasn't even in the late night news. The next morning, it was on the front page of all the journals. No, it was on page four and five, because everybody understood what I had explained. And yes, of course, when I returned from this trip, I had to go to the minister. Because yes, the whole government was, well, chatting with my minister, but he's out of protocol. We should have been informed first, and then we don't want to hear these things on the radio. But my minister understood why I did it. So yes, tactical and strategic, because this could have strategic impact, at least in the Netherlands, um, you have to consider how you deal with that. Because just the action of one soldier can have a huge impact. But as long as you stay with the facts, then everybody understands you. OK? Thank you for the question. I'll just, yeah. I just might have one question on indulgence. In, um, in 2013, you did a TEDx talk, Why I Choose the Gun, um, which I think is a pretty novel way for uh, your chief of army at the time to, to talk to people. I was just wondering if you could unpack that or, or talk about that a little bit, please. Yeah. Uh, every day, I was asking myself the question, how can I 
communicate to society, bring to society what our troops do for society. Every day I was asking myself that question. So you do strange things. And when TEDx Amsterdam asked me uh, to do a TED talk, uh, I got in contact with the guy who put the question for, and I asked him, why do you want to have me? Because it was not that normal in those days that soldiers in uniform were doing a TED talk. And this guy gave me a really nice answer. He said, well, General, if you are so crazy that you hold a lecture at a pop festival and stand there in uniform, you can do it at TEDx Amsterdam also. <laughs> and I had done that. I had been at a pop festival, and I just explained. I had, a, how do you call it, a bracelet with the text on it, artist backstage. <laughs> because there, I could reach to youngsters that I no, normally, well, ca can't reach. And I know it's only in the morning, so half of them is drunk, the other have probably drugs. But they will all, they will all take their cell phone and make a video or, or photograph and send it to all their friends, hey, an idiot of, in uniform is here. And then my message is on the video. So I was going to do a TED talk. And what I said, well, the essence is that a democratically controlled armed force is a force for good. And I had a female soldier, a young lieutenant, to come with me. And she was severely wounded in Afghanistan. She couldn't stand rather long on her two feet because one of her, foot, her feet was still badly injured. And she hands me out a gun. So I stand on the stage. And in the Netherlands, just in, as, as in Australia, you don't see much rifles in the street. There are some other countries. <laughs> so I turn to the audience, and the whole audience, they do this. I've got you. And then I explain this democratically controlled force, uh, uh, armed force is a force for good. At the end, who have seen the TEDx talk? What happens at the end? Do you still remember? At the end, I step away. You know the format of TEDx, eh? the red dot and the spotlights. I step away at the end from the red dot and the spotlights. And the young female lieutenant steps up again because the applause is for her, not for the general who has the privilege to lead them but she stands there on behalf of my 70,000 soldiers, those who really do the job, because leaders serve, and the applause is for those who do the job. That's my TEDx talk. Any more? Okay, last one. Sir so, Lieutenant Commander Woods, RAN. Thank you very much for your talk. During the period of 1995, I was serving in the British Army of the Rhine. And um, the most painful episode that we heard about is one that will be very familiar to you, the massacre of 8,000 Bosnian boys and men at Srebrenica. You've distinguished between responsibility and guilt. And no one suggests that Dutch troops were, were guilty but your own courts did find some level of responsibility. I've often wondered, was there anything in retrospect that could and should have been done by not just Dutch, but also all engaged forces that might have prevented that worst tragedy in post-war Europe? The battalion that was there was the 13th Dutch Infantry Battalion. At those days, I was commanding the 11th Dutch Infantry Battalion. We were companions in the same brigade. 
This is a tragedy for everybody who's involved. Of course, for the Bosnians, but it's a tragedy for that country, and it's a tragedy for the Netherlands. It's an, we call it an open nerve in our society. Wherever you come as a soldier, people will start on Srebrenica. Your idea that we should have done more, not only the Dutch, but as international community, because maybe not everybody knows, but the Dutch troops asked for air support. They came. Only once. They hit an armored vehicle of the Serbs, and then NATO decided they would stop immediately with the air support. So they left the Bosnians and the Dutch soldiers on their own. Nobody could have imagined what was going to happen. Nobody. I sometimes say, think the unthinkable, but this was not thinkable. Yes, the Serbs killed thousands of Bosniaks. If we would have used more force, either the Dutch or the international community, I'm not sure whether we could have stopped the Serbs, because they were fully confident and they were prepared to do a lot of bad things. The tragedy, I think, would go on with even bigger consequences. I hope we have learned as international community that we better think very well about the strategic concept that we put in place. Because with this tragedy, you never heard anymore of the guys who invented this tragedy. And they weren't Dutch. You know who I'm talking about. You never heard of them. They sat still. And yes, in the Netherlands, a judge has said that we have to take responsibility. Although the UN in the end is responsible, but we have a responsibility too. So uh, the Dutch government has asked to do something for the uh, population and uh, the families. You just heard my story how I think about guilty and responsibility. Yes, we are responsible. To what matter, to what extent, you can debate on that. But it's a tragedy f for my soldiers also. And we had an investigation in the Netherlands, and then a report was made on Srebrenica. And when I was a brigade commander of the same brigade, the report Become, became public. And the chairman of this committee, I asked to come to the brigade and explain to my soldiers what he had written in his, in his report. And we made a 10-pager as a summary, because, well, we as infantry soldiers, we know infantry soldiers don't read that much books. <laughs> and we had all the soldiers who were in Srebrenica in a big room, and they all had the ten pager in their hand, and he had written it. And then the chairman of this committee, he explains what the, well, the findings were. And then the soldiers were allowed to ask questions, and we had two interruption microphones. And at one microphone, at number three or four, was a soldier standing quite silent. But when he was in the position that he could ask a question, he couldn't. He started to cry. And then he started to talk to the chairman. And he pointed with a tent pager to the chairman and he said, you, you say that we were cowards. And he started to cry again. But he managed. And he said, so you say that, but m me, I, and my colleague, we were medics. We drove through the fire. They shot at our Red Cross, but we drove through the fires. We got the sick and the old people and the injured people and brought them to our doctor, and we go, go again. You said we were cowards. We were not cowards. 
And then he walked out of the room crying. And all these 800 colleagues, they stood up and gave him an applause because he literally gave to them what all the soldiers felt. It's a tragedy for the Bosnians. It's also a tragedy for a lot of Dutch soldiers. Thank you, sir.